1970, Congress passed the Clean Air Act, which was signed by Richard Nixon on New Year's Eve of that same year. And that act directs the EPA to set limits for six outdoor pollutants. And those pollutants are ozone, particulate matter, nitrogen oxides, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and lead. Now, 30 years later, the American Lung Association began publishing what they referred to as the state of the air report. And within this report, they relied on the data that was accumulated by the EPA as directed by the Clean Air Act. And the value of that data is it allows everyone to look and see what the quality of their air is in their local community. Now, as time moved on and air pollution monitoring equipment improved and spread out further across the country, the American Lung Association and the state of the air began focusing on two main pollutants, ozone and particulate matter, in this case, in the form of PM 2.5. So today we'd like to talk to Canfield's Kevin Wood, Vice President of Sales and Marketing about this report and the value that comes out of that from an air filtration point of view. So before we get started with that, Kevin, take a moment to introduce us to yourself, would you? Thank you, Mark. Um, my degree is in architecture and I started out my career working for consulting engineering and architecture firms that specialized in the design of clean rooms for semiconductor manufacturing spaces and other controlled environments. Uh, since then, for over 30 years, I've been involved in air pollution control and air filtration, and most recently the last 18 years with Canfield USA as Vice President of Sales and Marketing. Uh, I have been following the American Lung Association State of the Air report since it was first published in 2000, and then each year the new version has been released in April of every year since. Okay, great. So um, specifically, is can you tell us a little bit of, of why you find that so valuable? Because I know I've heard you mention this report several times over the years. So what is it specifically, a few things that uh, triggers you so that you really like to see this report and spread the information in it? I think there's several things, Mark, and the report has really evolved and expanded over the years. The first thing is what you mentioned, the fact that it tracks both particulate pollution and ozone pollution, which is gas pollution, both which are very harmful to humans. The second thing is the state of the air report over the years has continued to identify new scientific data that ties air pollution to more and more health conditions. Uh, early on, it was always thought that air pollution, particularly particulate matter, uh, only affected humans in the respiratory system. And it's been proven since then that it affects everything from blood pressure to diabetes, to cancer, to cardiovascular disease, and, and many other things impacting our human health. And it also impacts, as you would expect, both younger children or younger adults and older Americans, 65 and older. So the third thing that the uh, state of the air report has done is it's really taken that information down to the very local level, the state level, the county level, and the city level, and it shows what various groups within those areas are at risk, what percentage of the population they comp comprise, and then what percentage of the time or how many days a year are there unhealthy conditions in each of those local environments. And of course, the highlight of this most recent report, 2021, is that four in 10 Americans are almost over 40% of the people that live in our country, over 135 million people are exposed to dangerous air quality some portions of the year. And that covers over 217 counties that have unhealthy air currently in the United States. Yeah, I think I read that and that, that's a staggering number, 40% of the population. Um, so we were talking about the data that's accumulated, and I guess maybe we go back to that and start from the very beginning. Where does this data come from? And would you say that that's um, the manner in which the EPA collects that? Is that a reliable source of data? Can we trust the information? Yes, yeah, so since the Clean Air Act was established in 1970, the EPA has set up over 4,000 monitoring stations throughout the country that collect data hourly, daily, weekly, 
and that information is very, very reliable. And that's the base information that the American Lung Association uses to develop their report each year. Uh, I'd like to comment on that data because the Clean Air Act said that we should be um, particularly careful with what are called PM 2.5 and PM 10 particles. And what that means is particles that are 10 microns and larger and particles that are 2.5 microns and larger. And to put that into perspective, uh, human hair is about 60 to 70 microns. So we're talking about particles that are very small. The human eye cannot see particles that are less than 10 microns. So these dangerous particles that are in our air and that the EPA is monitoring are particles that we can't see. So the typical human walking around every day, either uh, externally or in, within a building, you can't really see by looking at the air, whether that air is unhealthy for you. So that's why it is so important that this information is monitored and gathered and analyzed for how it can impact uh, the, the entire country, literally. Okay, yeah, now, now we've had other people on here and we've talked about um, particulate matter and we've talked about PM 2.5, uh, but I've read some information about PM 1. Now, I don't see anything in here about PM 1. Um, and again, this is your business. What's your thoughts on PM 1 and is that likely to be measured in the future, would you say? Well, PM1 has evolved as becoming a very important target, and it was not included in the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act only went down to PM2.5. Scientific studies since that time have proven that even smaller particles, particles one micron and less, can be even more dangerous to human health. And it's those particles that can impact things that we never imagined before, such as blood pressure and diabetes and the ability of a brain and a child to develop at a normal pace. And so that has been recognized by scientific data, but it has not been captured and monitored by EPA at this point. Um, there was recently in the last couple of years, a global air filtration test standard developed by ISO called ISO 16890. And it measures air filter efficiency based on three parameters, PM10, PM 2.5 and PM 1, because it recognizes the ongoing information that says there's a lot of danger with those very small particles. And when you get to the small particles, those are particles that your body's natural defense systems cannot filter out. So those very small particles, uh, PM 1 and smaller, literally are inhaled into your body and can go through your lungs and directly into your bloodstream. And so that's why they can cause a lot of health issues that weren't previously identified. Okay, thanks. So uh, based upon the fact that ISIL is an international organization uh, and what else you've said, I, I assume at some point in the near future, PM1 will start to be monitored and recorded and it will show up on this uh, state of the air report. So I guess, I guess next question then, the other item that the state of the air talked about was, and you mentioned a little bit, was gaseous contaminants, and they, and they, um, they record ozone. So what is it about ozone that we should watch for, and what's the highlights about that dangerous gas? Well, there are both good and, and bad aspects to ozone. Ozone up, up in the high levels of our atmosphere is created naturally, and it's an important element to block UV, UV rays from reaching us, which can damage uh, both our planet and our people. So at the high level, ozone is very important. At the ground level, ozone can be very dangerous to humans. It has been proven many, many years ago that ozone in uh, high concentrations is carcinogenic. And so ozone is typically created when um, nitrous dioxide or nitrogen, excuse me, dioxide uh, is present in the air, which is created by processes of internal combustion. So power plants, uh, automotive vehicles and trucks. And when that combines with VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and they're exposed to heat and sunlight, it gets cooked into a a, a product called ozone, which has three oxygen atoms in that. And ozone can be very harmful to the respiratory system. In low level amounts, it can be an irritant. In higher level amounts or longer exposure, it can cause allergies, 
asthma, COPD, and even pneumonia. So it's something we're keeping a very close eye on and that this report does a very good job of quantifying at the local level. Okay, so if we uh, just do a quick sum up, we, we talked about that the Clean Air Act um, began this and that the state of the our air report focuses on both particulate matter and then as you said, ozone. So they accumulate this data and put this in the report so if someone's going to pick up and start looking at this report, what is it about this report specifically that they should look at? What, what, uh, where would you guide them to, uh, uh, to take a careful reading of? Well, you want to see how bad the air is in a specific area that you reside or work. Uh, I mentioned that four in 10 Americans are exposed to unhealthy air, about 135 million. 54 million Americans are exposed to dangerous air that is dangerous every day. So depending on how bad the air is in the area that you live would determine what kind of steps that you might want to take to try to mitigate exposure to those particularly very small particles, both where you work and where you live. Okay, thank you. Now now, Kevin, I would say that you're in the uh, the air filtration business, so I assume you have some solutions to this. So if we start to take a look at this, and again, we go back, there's two broad categories, particulate matter and ozone. Do you have solutions uh, for people who might look at that report and then maybe they're kind of surprised and they say, holy cow, I'm in a, I'm in a very bad area for pollution. What would you tell them there are some options for them? Well, the first thing to look at is, do you have the proper rated efficiency air filter in the system, in your building, in the air handling units to remove these dangerous particles from the air? And you need to make sure that the air filters that you are using maintain their efficiency the entire time in use because there are air filters whose efficiency degrades over time. And you wanna make sure you pick the proper level of filtration and that the air filters that you use maintain that filtration. Now, products that are designed to remove particles from the air are different than air filters that are designed to remove gases from the air. So if ozone is an issue, you may need a different type of filtration product or in a commercial or industrial building, you may need to add an additional stage of filtration one stage to take out particle contaminants and another stage to take out the gaseous contaminants. So you need to look at both of those things and see if they are one or the other is prevalent in your area or both. And then the second thing you need to consider is many times the ventilation systems or air handling units and buildings don't properly serve every space or they don't serve spaces where people tend to congregate. So you also need to consider should you put room air purifiers in certain spaces to supplement the uh, ventilation system to make sure that every place that's occupied by people is safe and clean air is provided? Okay, that's good to know. So while this report points out uh, the two uh, pollutions and what their level are and where you are, you can look and see where that is. And then as you say, there are solutions for the, both of those that people can uh, take a look at and see if they can protect themselves a little bit better. And that's probably the real value of this report. I guess uh, kind of beginning to wrap this up, um, there's always things coming down the pike in the future. What do you see in the future for this report? What emerging trends would you predict that you might see in the future when you look through this report and then the, in the country and the health of the country's air in general? Well, I think there's three primary things, uh, climate change, wildfires, and then COVID or other pandemic viruses that could strike our country. Uh, in the case of climate change, if temperature and the amount of sunlight increases over time, that is definitely going to increase the generation of ozone and it's going to expand the geographical areas where ozone is a problem. If you look at the most polluted cities in the country, a high percentage of them are in the West. Uh, that's not exclusively true. There are areas of Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, and Texas that have unhealthy areas, but primarily they're in the West. Climate change will spread some of that to more of the, the Eastern half of the US. 
Uh, wildfires is another topic that has gotten worse in recent years. And while wildfires are primarily in the western part of the U.S., uh, they're expanding in that area. Wildfires create large amounts of both very large particles and very small particles. And most people would assume that unless you live in the area where wildfires are, such as California or Oregon, that you're not at risk, but you are. Uh, the very small particles due to wind can literally get spread across the country and a wildfire in California could greatly increase the particle count in the Northeast or the Southeast. Uh, Harvard did a study uh, several years ago that proved that 30% of the pollution in the United States is generated outside of the United States, including industrialization in Asia. So these very, very small uh, PM 2.5 and PM 1 particles have the ability to travel a long distance and uh, spread that pollution. And then the third thing are the COVID and other viruses uh, that both currently exist and might come along. And we know uh, through a lot of study that COVID, the primary size of those virus particles is 2.5 microns, some larger, many smaller. So you have to make sure you have air filtration in buildings to take those out of the air. And the other thing with those viruses is that they are primarily spread airborne and that they can be spread by people that are asymptomatic. So you may be in a work environment where nobody is showing signs of the virus, but if those small particles aren't removed by the air filters in the air handling and ventilation system, or there aren't additional air purifiers in place, a large number of people within an occupied building can be exposed. And of course, because of the tragedy of COVID, we have gained a lot of scientific information about viruses, both that exist right now and future things that could impact our country. Yeah, thank you, that's true. And we've heard from others on here that uh, if you're unfortunately in, in an area of of high pollution as, as maybe out uh, defined in these state of the air report, the, uh, the concentration of COVID cases is actually higher because of the, uh, of the dirty air. Kevin, thank you for that. That's a lot of good information. And I think I would encourage everyone to refer to this report. It's, uh, you can find it in the American Lung Association's website and it's put out every year and it's called state of the air report. Kevin, again, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. And uh, again, I would encourage everybody to look at the information and then consult with a local air filter expert uh, to help you make the right choices to protect yourself, your family, uh, your co-workers, or if you're an employer, your employees from these dangerous pollutants that are only uh, becoming more prevalent within the United States.